Our gospel reading for the morning is found in Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35, which you'll find beginning on page 952 of the Pew Bible, 952. Much of the impact turns on the meaning of a talent and a denarii. Uh, let me just stick in a little side thing. Uh, talent and denarii were weights for precious metals in the ancient days, not a coin. A denarii was the amount of silver that you paid for a day's wages to a laborer or to a foot soldier. So then... Uh, a talent was equal to 3,000 denarii, or about 10 years of income for a laborer. 10,000 talents would be equal to 3,000 lifetimes of earning, at least several billions of dollars today. And if it were ten talents, as some would argue it should be translated, it would still be millions of dollars, equally unattainable by anybody who is a wage earner. Let us hear the word of the Lord from Matthew 18, 21 to 35. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but seventy-seven Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged. I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown in prison until he could pay off the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. This is the word of the Lord.
I invite you to pray with me. Each of us is at a different journey on the road of life, O oh God, different place and different experiences. But we all in common are your children. And we are here to have our needs met according to that which is pleasing to you. And so grant that we may find in this message and in this time of worship together that which you want us to know, that which you want us to understand. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, forgiveness. Without forgiveness, communities impossible. And from the very beginning, God created us to live in community. From the Garden of Eden on. Now, community can be broken in, uh, in hundreds of ways. In my family, my aunt carried on a feud with my mother and my grandmother that went on and off for decades. Visiting and communicating would stop for years at a time. Community broke down in my family for grudges that were held tightly. Robbing my cousins and me of years of friendship through our childhood and teen years. On a world scale, the Israelis and the Palestinians will not say to each other, okay, enough is enough. We must forgive each other's atrocities and start anew so that our people may live together in a community of peace rather than dying separately in the violence of hatred. When the Serbs and the Croatians and the Herzegovinians waged war against each other, the U.S. got involved in that conflict that had pitted Muslims against Eastern Orthodox and Orthodox against Roman Catholics, and they went at it back and forth, and that struggle between those ethnic groups has gone on for a thousand years. It's a struggle that it's, imagine, hatred that cannot die and continues recurring Rounds of recriminations for 40 generations. Whether in my family, or the Balkans, or the Middle East, or in a thousand variations of the Hatfields and the McCoys, without forgiveness there can be no community. The ongoing conflict may be between politicians, between a mother and daughter, office workers, neighbors, church members. And the battle cry is, I will never forgive him. I'll get even. Some of us even shake our fists at heaven at God. I'll never forgive you for taking my child. And so without forgiveness, community is broken for a season, broken for a lifetime, broken for a millennium, broken for eternity. And so the question, what is our ultimate goal in forgiving or not forgiving another person or a whole nation or a whole culture? Is our purpose to establish community or is it to break up community? Because that's what forgiveness is really about. Breaking up community is for the purpose of justifying and promoting self. I'm right. I deserve better. I'm in control here, not you. No, I'm right, and I deserve better than you. But you hurt me. You betrayed me. You ignored me, and nothing can erase that. Forgive you? Ha! <laughs> In contrast, rebuilding community is for the purpose of acknowledging the other person's value and humility as much as our humility and value. 
Now, if you've never noticed, the Bible can be really frustrating in taking a Scripture and using a passage to build your case on anything or support your position on anything. We call it proof texting. Find what we believe and then find a text that underwrites it and proves it. And so as I'm coming together for this sermon on forgiveness as the topic, I I knew in general terms where I was headed, and it seemed a perfect text would be Matthew 18, 21, and 22. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. And Jesus said to him, I tell you not seven times, but seventy times seven. Now, Peter thought he was being generous. A woman comes to work spaced out on drugs, and you say, I forgive you once. You say, I forgive you twice. But seven times? Get real, twice, and she's out of here. A man dumps his garbage on your lawn. Maybe you forgive him the first time. Maybe even the second time, but seven times. The school bully beats up your child, bloodies his nose, blacks his eyes, steals his lunch money six times, and you're still forgiving him? You see, Peter thought he was going way beyond reasonable godly responses with his seven times forgiven. Jesus must have blown blown Peter out of his sandals when he said, huh, Not seven times, Peter, 70 times seven, 490 times. And if you're into biblical numbers, seven is the number for perfection, ten is the number for infinity. So you forgive him, perfection times infinity, which basically is, Peter, you don't ever, ever stop forgiving. But you see, it's never a good idea to prove your point by selecting a Bible verse out of the center of something and then just ignoring what's on either side of it. You have to take the Bible passage in the context. And this created some real problems for me because preceding that passage was Jesus teaching about a brother who sins against us. And Jesus says we are to try to resolve the problem one-on-one. Go to the person and one-on-one try to resolve it. If it doesn't work, take it to the church council to try to resolve it. And if that doesn't work, throw the varmint out. Eh, paraphrase. (laughs) Treat him like a Gentile. Same thing. And the passage following the parable was about the landowner who forgave this huge debt. And Ernie helped us to try to get our minds wrapped around how genuinely huge this debt is. And he gave a big sob story to the landowner, and the landowner bought it, and he uh, let him off the hook, forgave him the debt, forgave him, and set him on his way. And the man goes happily out, having been relieved of that debt and being forgiven, and he is so happy until he meets a guy on the corner that owes him five bucks. He tries to strangle him and throws him in the debtor's prison for not paying. And the landowner comes back to him and says, what have I heard? And he goes to debtor's prison until he pays it off, which will be never. Okay, so what's that forgive 70 times 7 business? So I decided, well, I didn't like Matthew very much. I'll go over to Luke and see what Luke has to say. So I went to the 17th chapter of Luke, and I found Jesus saying, Take heed to yourselves if your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in one day and turns to you seven times and asks for forgiveness, you must forgive him. Well, what was the context of that passage? Well, preceding it was Jesus' warning that any adult who causes a little child to sin would be better off having a millstone tied around his or her neck and tossed into the deepest part of the sea compared to what they are going to face with an angry God for damaging a little child's soul. And afterwards, at the end of that, when Jesus talks about this forgiving seven times a day business, the astonished disciples cry out, increase our faith. 
Indeed, you bet. Increase mine too, Lord. I didn't like this passage any better. So it turned out that the key passage for this sermon provides more problems than solutions. So let's see if we can get some handles on this business of forgiving others and ourselves. In the larger biblical context of those teachings on forgiveness, one thing that we recognize is that forgiving someone does not mean that they have avoid the consequences of their sin. Sometimes we don't want to forgive people because we're afraid they'll avoid the consequences of their sin. We'll let them off the hook. But forgiving someone does not mean that they will avoid the consequences of their sin. Bill Pelkey's grandmother was an outgoing woman who gave Bible lessons to the neighborhood kids. She invited them in, give them cookies, and all the children in the neighborhood loved to come to her house, and she'd tell them Bible stories. One day, on May 1985, she opened her door to four girls from the high school down the street. And before she knew it, her attackers had knocked her to the floor, and the girls had ransacked her house, and they fled in her old car, leaving her on the floor, bleeding to death from multiple stab wounds. And the girls were caught giving joy rides to their friends, and they went on trial. And one girl got 35 years, and two girls got 60 years, and the last, Paula Cooper, got death. And Bill was satisfied that at least one girl got the death penalty. Otherwise, the court would be saying that his grandmother wasn't important, and he felt that she was very important. About four months later, Bill was going through some emotional upheavals. You ever have that time when you're going through something's wrong and you can't figure out what it is, but it's all churning up inside of you and you can't make sense out of it? And this is what was happening to Bill Pelkey as he was going. It was all, and finally he cries out in prayer, Why, God, why? He prays at work. He's operating a crane in a steel mill. And there in that crane, he's crying out, Why, God, why? What's going on? And into his mind came an image of Paula Cooper, the youngest female in the nation sitting on death row. And she's sitting there in the cell in this image saying, What have I done? What have I done? And he remembered back to the sentencing when the girl's grandfather wailed, They're killing my baby! as tears streamed down his cheeks and face. And Bill said, I began to think of my grandmother, her faith, and what the Bible says about forgiveness. And I recalled three Bible verses, the one which says that God can only forgive you when you forgive others, the one where Jesus tells Peter to forgive 70 times 7, and the one where Jesus is on the cross, and He's looked down at His executioners, and He says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And Bill suddenly knew that he had to forgive those girls, which he knelt down and did right there in that crane. And then Bill visited Paula Cooper several times in prison, trying to pass on to her his grandmother's faith in helping her to grasp the faith. Now, Paul has stabbed his grandmother 33 times, and she still faced the electric chair. But Bill concluded, as long as I kept hating those girls, they continued to control my life. And once I chose to forgive them, I became free. Like the men in Jesus' parable, forgiveness doesn't mean we avoid the consequences, but it does mean that we're set free to rebuild community. You see, forgiveness changes the dynamics of a relationship. One of the most famous American missionaries in the 20th century, in the middle of the 20th century, was Dr. E. Stanley Jones. 
And uh, he was holding some Christian meetings, and at one of them, a Hindu manufacturer in Satal said to Dr. Jones, do you know why I have come? Years ago, when I was a boy, we heckled a missionary preacher in the bazaar, and I threw tomatoes at him. And he wiped off the tomato juice from his face, and then after the meeting, he took us all to a candy shop and bought us candy. I saw the love of Christ that day, and that's why I'm here. That evangelist forgave the boys for the indignities they publicly visited upon him, and his relationship to them, you see, was far more important than any desire he had for punishment or revenge. And his forgiveness became the vehicle for leading that man to Christ. Now, what's holding a grudge compared to that act of leading a woman or a man or a child to heaven. As long as we hate others, resent another, live with anger, we live with the corrosive battery acid that drips and drips and eats holes into our souls. We are not free. We are controlled by the one that we resent. As long as we refuse forgiveness, the door to God is closed and the melody of God is silenced in our hearts. So how do we make sense out of Jesus saying to Peter, don't ever stop forgiving? Well, to begin with, we need to admit that we all have wounds. No, we all have wounds. We all live in pain and disappointment at some point in life. We all have feelings of loneliness that lurk beneath all of our successes somewhere on our life's journey. We all possess feelings of uselessness that hide under all the praise that we receive. We all struggle with feelings of meaninglessness even when people say we're fantastic. And that's what makes some of us grab on to people and expect from them affection and affirmation and love and approval that they just cannot give us. Over the years, I've dealt with a number of girls who have purposely gotten pregnant to have babies so they'll feel important and needed and loved all of which lays an impossible responsibility upon that child for its immature mother. Husbands or wives lay upon their spouses the responsibility of meeting all their emotional and security and social and spiritual needs. And if we want other people to give us something that only God can give us, we're guilty of idolatry. We're turning that person into our God. We say, love me. And before long, we're making demands of him or manipulating her for our wishes. Andre Trochme was a pastor to an active pacifist group in southern France in the 1930s and 40s, and they were busy rescuing Jews and Christians from the German Nazis and the Vichy. And they placed their own lives in mortal danger time and time again during those terrible years, saving lives from the Vichy and the, and the Nazis in the name of Christ. And Andre's oldest son, Jean-Pierre, was destined to take his father's place as head of the congregation one day. And then at 19 years old, that son hung himself in the bathroom in front of the mirror. Was it an accident? Was it on purpose? Only God knows. But Pastor Trachme could not reconcile his son's death. He agonized over the absurd, chaotic accidents in this life, and he railed at God's silence. And years later, 
he wrote that without knowing it, he had become, he had come to join the atheist philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre, whose belief was that each person is to himself a dark, useless hole in a full, pointless world. Now, there's a philosophy to live by. In his agony, whom should Pastor Truck me forgive? Should he forgive God, who was silent and did nothing to save his son? Should he forgive Jean-Pierre, who caused his parents untold pain and robbed the world of a future leader? Should he forgive himself for not having somehow known what was happening and saved his son from the tragedy? As a dark, useless hole in a pointless world, Andre Trockme wasn't ready to forgive anyone, and he became really ineffective as a pastor for a long time. As a friend, as a community leader, he wasn't of any value to anybody. And so back to our question. What is our goal in destroying or repairing community? For that's at the heart of forgiveness And what was Jesus telling us in his response to Peter that we must keep on and on forgiving the sinner? It couldn't be that there is no judgment in sin. The stories in the scriptural context show us indeed there are consequences to our sin and very serious ones. It cannot mean that there's no accountability for us. There is great accountability But Peter's trying to get handles on the deeper ramifications of sin and how far we should go in this forgiveness business. Remember Nasruddin? He's over here searching for his key under the light where it's easy to see. But where's the key? It's over here. And so Peter is Nasruddin. He's over here looking in the wrong place. for the answers. You see, Peter's problem is that he's focusing on the sin. At the same time, Jesus turns the issue away from the act of sin to the relationship that is being abused. And so Peter's question is, how many offenses before I drop the hammer? And Jesus' question is, how far will you go to repair community? The issue is that we must forgive each other for not being God. We have such expectations of everybody else. For those of us in the Christian faith, forgiveness means that I continually am willing to forgive the other person for not fulfilling all of my needs and desires and doing exactly what I want. Forgiveness says, I know you love me, but you don't have to love me unconditionally because only God can do that. I too must ask for forgiveness for not being able to fulfill everybody else's needs, their total needs, and be everything to all people because no human can do that. Forgiveness is the key to community. We must continually say, I forgive my mother because she's not everything I'd like her to be. I forgive my dad because he did the best he could, but it wasn't enough. I forgive my friend for not being able to supply every emotional need I have. And this is so crucial in the me age when we're constantly looking to blame others, anybody but ourselves. We have to blame our parents or our church or our teachers or our doctors or society for not giving us all that we need. And we get so angry and filled with rage and disconnectedness and distrust, but only God's love is is unlimited. Our love is not. And so Nasruddin is looking for all the resources that he wants and needs over here, like that old country western song, looking for love in all the wrong places. He's looking in all the wrong places for the sources of his, for the resources that he needs in life, when the resources are really over here. 
Only God's resources can sustain us up to the full measure of our needs. Human resources don't have the capacity to do that. However faithful and caring we humans are, we'll always have some elements of frustration and disappointment in our responses. And therefore, forgiveness becomes the key word for divine love within the human context. Divine love within the human context. How many times shall I forgive you, Lord? How many times shall I forgive, Lord? Peter, Amy, John, Leslie, you don't ever stop forgiving. Oh, God, we can't do anything like that on our own. But your power in us can. How we praise you for that power. Amen.